Please open your Bibles, if you have one, to the 119th Psalm, Psalm 119, and we'll pick up in verse 145. We've been studying through the 119th Psalm now, I'm going on a year in conjunction with the book of James, and we're drawing near the end of both studies. I'll remind you that the 119th Psalm f- follows a very clear acrostic pattern, each eight verse stanza beginning each line with the first and then the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet organized and so we're looking at each of these eight verse chunks together and this morning we're going to consider how to pray in extreme distress and persecution one of the things that I find so helpful of the Psalms why I like returning to them again and again and again is God teaches us in the Psalms how to emotionally process and pray and respond to the variegated trials of life. I've heard one person say the Apostle Paul probably has the clearest distillation of New Covenant Christian gospel doctrine, the, the mental life of the church, but the Psalms give us the emotional life. And, and one of the things I really appreciate about the Psalms is their realness. I think sometimes people can get the impression of Christianity, that we're always happy, things are always okay, things are always just fine, everything's okily dokily. And you read the Psalms and they tell another story. Oh yes, there are peaks of praise, peaks of, of hallelujahs. And then there are passages like this morning's text. Which, which should give us some comfort and give us some pause for thought. Comfort when we find ourselves in the valley. Comfort when we find ourselves in deep darkness. This is not some place God did not anticipate his children would go. This is not something for which he has left us unequipped. And preparation and girding up your minds to understand that if the Psalms are so full of lament, so full of expressions of grief, anguish, We ought not to expect to be spared seasons of that in our life. Not the entirety of our life, but seasons of that. And so, whether or not that's where you are right now, God would have us learn how to to pray, how to approach him in times of deep distress. I'd like to just read Psalm 119, verses 145 to 152, and we'll go through this looking at it in five points. Let's begin by reading this stanza. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice. According to your steadfast love, O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Let's pray. Lord God. We thank you that you have given us songs to sing, prayers to pray, patterns to follow, and many positions in life. Lord, I pray that for those of us not in the deep valley at this moment, that we would prepare well, pay attention, learn well how we should approach you, how to pray to you in times of deep distress. And Lord, for those here who are in deep anguish and suffering, I pray that your word would heal, strengthen, that they would be given a path to walk, a song to sing, that you might show yourself to be faithful to them as they faithfully receive your word. Lord, may all of us be changed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Throughout Psalm 119... The psalmist has alternately been considering his foes and the glories of God's word. But the foes have shown up. We've suggested that 
likely the psalmist is writing not in the land. He refers to foreign princes plotting against him. We consider that Daniel, the prophet, may well be a good fit. I'm not saying it is Daniel, but someone like Daniel is, fits very well. This morning, um, his, his awareness of his danger, his exposure, the threat against him is weighing heavy on him. And we get some of the most visceral, unrestrained appeals to God. And so I just want to learn five points in prayer. And I want to also suggest to you sort of using the Hebrew logic, arguing from the greater to the lesser, that if this holds true in times of extreme peril, if if these principles are sound and true when the going gets tough, how much more true are they in every lesser situation? If God is dependable, if these are faithful truths we can cling to even in the whirlwind, how much more should they inform our prayer life and our thinking when we are not in the maelstrom? First, pray fervently. Pray fervently. Verse 145 and 146 express parallel thoughts, each in three parts. That's why there's three points. They're saying virtually the same thing. Um, The Hebrew begins with, I cry or I call. With my whole heart, I cry. Verse 146, I call to you. Then the appeal, answer me. In this 146, save me. And then the statement of purpose, I will keep your statutes and in 146 that I may observe your testimony. So you can see the parallelism of these two thoughts. So let's, let's get three points from this. First, his earnestness and his urgency. I, I love the language here. With my whole heart, I cry. Now, there are many ways and models that scripture gives us for prayer. Um, some prayers clearly are well thought through beforehand. Our, this psalm itself is a perfect example. I would find it very hard to believe that the psalmist of Psalm 119 spontaneously just popped up this perfectly ordered acrostic. It speaks of planning. It speaks of thought beforehand. And church history is littered, littered with examples of people literally composing their prayers before they pray them. And that, that is a biblical and faithful thing that can be done. But there are other prayers that are just spontaneous. They're just coming up. They're, they're visceral. They're unplanned. This speaks of nothing held back. Uh, sometimes we can be so focused on being respectable, keeping our composure, we can forget some of the examples Scripture gives of people coming to God, pouring out their hearts in entirely um, undignified ways. T- turn to First Samuel. I'll give you one, one example. One example. This opening verse gives us the license and the model. Just just pour your heart out to God. Freely. This is the chapter one. This is the birth narrative of Samuel, the prophet. And you'll remember his mother, Hannah. Well, let's just pick up reading. Um, 1 Samuel 1, verse 3. This man used to go up year after year from his city to worship and to sacrifice the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peniah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. So he has two wives. One, the Lord has given children to Hannah, his barren. And he loves Hannah and her rival, well, sorry, verse 5. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritation because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. I mean, this, this is real suffering, real anguish, real torment. And her husband, Elkanah, Therefore, oh, sorry, um, and Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now, Eli the priest was sitting at the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. 
And she vowed a vow to the Lord, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. So Hannah, the text is stressing the anguish, the grief. And she, sense, and she expresses a sense of freedom in approaching God, pouring out her heart so that an onlooker thinks she's babbling drunkenly. Not all prayer looks dignified. When the psalmist here begins this section, with all my heart I cry out to answer. I, I get that same sense of just authentic, genuine opening of his heart. Um, we should feel free to draw this close to God, especially adding in the new covenant realities of the Holy Spirit. This is precisely the type of direct approach we are encouraged to make. Think of Paul's words in Romans 8. 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I've got some young ones in my home that generally don't cry, Abba, Father. They're crying, Mama. But they cry loudly, incessantly, urgently when they sense they have need. And we are told we, we can call out to God in that same way. That This psalmist here is modeling that same type of approach, urgently calling out to God. Don't, you don't need to always hold back. You, you can just pour it all out. Psalms like this model that. So his earnestness and his urgency. And I think the reason for this distress we, we're going to see down in verse 150 is these enemies drawing near. He senses that he's in an urgent, desperate situation. His panic, his, his fear, his anguish is rising up, and he just lets it all out to the Lord. Um, the Lord can handle your, your fears and concerns. You can cast your burdens upon him. Next, we see his great need of deliverance. His great need of deliverance. Now, the immediate request in 145 is, answer me, but 146 sheds some light on the particular type of answer he wants. He wants an answer of help. I'm in trouble. Answer me. Help Save me. Now, we, we use the word save in a number of ways. I think here, probably deliver, rescue me from the peril I'm immediately in. Um, the Lord God invites us to call on him for help in the day of trouble. That's exactly what's happening here. He, he's sincere, pouring out his heart and his urgency. His need is deliverance. We've, we've seen this prayer request again and again in Psalm 119. But also notice his right purpose, his right purpose. Um, we, we saw in James the danger of coming to God and asking for things to spend them on our own pleasures. Remember James 4, you ask and you have not because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own pleasures. The psalmist here is asking for deliverance, but clearly in view, deliver me so that I can continue serving you. Deliver your servant so your servant can serve I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. And so we're invited this sort of authentic, real, desperate, loud approach to call for help. But we ought to come with the right motives. Are, are we coming as servants of the living God? Or are we coming as worshipers of other things? The danger is we want something else more than God. It's being threatened. Oh, God, help keep my idol safe. And James warns us we're not going to get answered if that's what we do. But if your desire is to serve and please God, draw near, cry out, plead for help. God has modeled this. Feel free and unrestrained in pouring out your heart to him. Pray fervently. Pray fervently. Um, second, pray unceasingly. Pray unceasingly. 147 to 148. Another parallel lines here, this time expressing different thoughts. But again, you can see the, the similarity. I rise before dawn. My eyes are awake before the watches. And so he's doing things before things. Um, 
I rise before the dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. So first point, he rises early and he stays up late. He rises early and he stays up late. Um, Now this could be purely a result of his anxiety and his sleeplessness and his fear. Or it could be a matter of discipline. I tend to think it's both. Um, They're rising early crying for help more likely coming from his inability to sleep and rest. He's he's anxious. He's calling out to God. But this gives us also then a model of what to do when you can't sleep. When you're so troubled, you can't find rest. The psalmist here is redeeming that time. I rise early before the dawn and stress. No. And cry for help. I hope in your words. Notice then that prayer is his first priority. Prayer is his first priority. Where's the first place of help he goes? He wakes up. He's troubled. He's afraid. He calls out to God for help. That's his first place. I remember a story. uh, I think I heard Al Mohler tell of Martin Luther. Martin Luther used to have a practice of getting up in the morning and praying for an hour before he'd start his day. And one particular week, he had such a busy week um, that one of his students asked him, Dr. Martin, do you, do you still plan on getting up and praying for an hour, given how much you have to do this week? He said, oh, no, no, I'm going to need at least three hours of prayer. Well, that's, that's right priorities. He, he understands that the only hope he has, and, and sometimes this is the lesson God has to teach us in distress. Uh, usually the distress comes because we see no earthly human deliverance, and so we're cast upon the Lord. But God would have us learn to go to him first, to call out to him for help first, I rise before the dawn and cry for help. Prayer is his first priority, but also noted, and it is rooted in his hope. In in these two verses, we're going to see the cyclical um, relationship between trusting and hoping in God's word and your prayer life. His prayer life is coming out of his hope in God's word because, notice the language, I hope in your words. The logic is, you've made promises to me. You've promised good things to me. And I'm hoping in those promises, and that is what spurs me on to get up early and call on you to keep your word, to, to fulfill those promises to me. His, his urgent and his unceasing prayer life is rooted in his hope in God's word. So his hope in scripture is what fuels his prayer life, right? So he gets up early, crying for help, and he does that because he hopes in God's words, Right. Also, though, notice his prayer fuels his meditation of God's word. So the, the morning earliness emphasizes his prayer. But in 148, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. And what he's saying is when, when the busyness of the day is done, I don't go straight to sleep. I'm eager to chew on, to meditate on, to consider your words and your promises. You can see how his prayer life is fueling his scripture intake, and his scripture intake is fueling his prayer life in a virtuous circle. And, and that's, that's the right pattern. Our prayers should drive us to God's word, and God's word should drive us to prayer. As we're seeing new things God is promising, new glories, new goodnesses, new things to hope in, we have new things to pray about. And as we pray, and as we bring our petitions to God, this should drive us back to God's word. That, that's the pattern here. And it's the pattern I certainly see in people when they're in the deep, dark valley. I, I've seen it again and again. We may do well to begin practicing this without need of the dark valley. But when you're in the dark valley, when you can't sleep when you can't get your mind off your your distress, take that anxiety and let it fuel your prayer life. Let it fuel your scripture intake. And those are good uses for that energy. Those are good uses for that energy. He's up early. He's up. He stays up late. He's crying for help. He's meditating on God's promise. And his trust in God's word is fueling his prayer life. And his prayer life is fueling his trust in God's word. Okay, so we pray fervently, we pray unceasingly. Third, pray according to God's character. Pray according to God's character. And that's the parallelism we see here in 149. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord. 
According to your justice, give me life. Now, it's popularly said through um, many modern-day religious experts that all religions basically teach the same thing, that we all basically are coming to the same God. And I want you to consider that if you were to observe the prayer lives of different practitioners of different religions, there may appear at first to be some credence to such a thought. After all, I'm guessing most Americans, whether they be Muslim, whether they be Christian, whether they be um, Jewish, whether they be Zoroastrian, are making many of the same requests. Requests for safety, healing, financial help. Um, I, I, if you were to put a camera on the wall and watch from a, from a fly-in-the-wall perspective, it may look like we're doing many of the same things. And that may lead some to conclude, well, we all are doing the same things. What, what makes our prayers and our prayer life distinctively Christian? What, what, what makes it different? Because I don't think we are all doing the same thing. I don't think um, we're praying to the same person. I don't think that the way the Bible models us to pray is the same as everybody else. Well, I think two things, and one of them seen right here, is again and again the scriptures encourage us, teach us, lead us to pray to God as a person and involve his character and who he is in our prayer lives. We're reasoning with God. The psalmist here is reasoning with him. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, which is a way of saying because of who you are, do this. Because who you said yourself to be, do this. Our prayers are shaped and formed by God's character, his person. And in that sense, they won't just fit on some other lowercase g, God. Only the God of Scripture, only the God who reveals himself as the Lord God Almighty fits this description. And therefore, our prayers fit his person. Now, that, that saying, according to your steadfast love, turn, turn in your Bibles to Exodus. Um, this, this should be a spot, we've gone here enough, that I would encourage you to, to bookmark or, or footnote. It is remarkable in the revelation of who God is. You remember, the Israelites are in Egypt, and many of them have forgotten God's name. So Moses has to ask, who shall I say sent me? Because God has already revealed himself to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, well what's your name? Who, who should I say sent me? And there he reveals, tell them I am sent you. And so the first thing Moses and the Israelites are taught about who God is by God is that he is the one who is self-existent. He is the one who is. Well, here on Mount Sinai is the next great verbal declaration of who God is. Moses goes up, he's interceded for the people, he has pleaded with the Lord to be merciful to the people after they worship the golden calf, and in Exodus 34, he has asked, well actually in 33, he's asked the Lord to show him his glory, and the Lord um, reveals his name to him in 34, and this is a, a pivotal passage in the Old Testament, it gets repeated over and over and over again, portions of this. Um, verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And when you see Lord in all caps, it's, it's in, for the ESV, it's their way of communicating this is the divine name, what is sometimes um, translated as Yahweh. This is God's special personal name. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. It's remarkable. God says, let me tell you more about who I am, who the Lord is. I forgive whom I forgive. I forgive thousands, and I don't let guilty people go free. I imagine Moses was a little puzzled by this. These two statements of the character of our God. He is a God who is abounding in steadfast, loyal, faithful love, and he is forgiving, and he is gracious, and he does not let guilty people go free. 
Of course, at the cross, we see those realities perfectly in harmony, where God punishes our sin in Jesus Christ on the cross. Not one of our sins goes unpunished. Nothing gets swept under the rug. Perfect love and mercy meet with perfect justice and wrath. But here, the Lord God tells Moses these two sort of wings, these two themes. I am a gracious, merciful, forgiving, and abounding in steadfast love. And I by no means clear the guilty. Well, these are the two threads the psalmist next prays according to. This revelation of God's character. You've declared this is who you are. So in keeping with who you are, in accordance with who you are, hear my voice according to your steadfast love. I've said this before, but God's steadfast love is is somewhat of a technical term in the Old Testament. It always refers to his covenant or loyal love. The love he has for people in covenant with him. So the Bible can speak of God loves the sparrows when they cry to him for food. He loves the stars and the universe. But this word, this ESV pretty consistently translates steadfast love, is only ever used for God's love to people in covenant with him. Um, You could call it his gospel love or this side of the new covenant. It's his love for his children of faith in Jesus Christ. And so maybe a a new covenant way for us to to approach God in prayer this way is, Lord, because of the love you have for us in Jesus Christ, because of the love you have for me and the promises you've made to me in Jesus Christ, hear my voice. You're praying according to who he is and his character. You're praying according to what he's promised. Your, Your prayers are conforming to the person to whom you are addressing. And Jesus has some remarkable statements to make. In John 16, 26 and 27, Jesus tells his disciples, In that day you will ask in my name. By the way, when Jesus says in my name, it's the same concept as this. According to my character and who I am, your name is who you are. You think of the, like, do you have a good name with them, your reputation? it's, It's the embodiment of who you are and your values. It's not a magic formula. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. Jesus is saying, you're going to be able to directly address the Father. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And so we can come before God's throne. We can cry out to him with all our heart. But we ought to do so according to the promises he's made to us. Which is, again gets back to how prayer and the scripture fuel each other. How do you know who God is apart from his word? How do you know what he's promised you? What he's declared apart from his word? And those revelations of himself, those promises to his people are the very lines we're to be praying along. They fuel each other. According to his covenant love. According to his covenant love. Point B, secondly, according to his justice. According to his justice. I think that's the other thread. There's a text variant that could make your judgments as possible. But I think he's getting both wings of this revelation from Exodus 34. Because he, because he, 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 he's innocent. Um, when the psalmist talks about justice and according to my righteousness, we've seen this already in Psalm 119. He's not claiming a perfect Legal, forensic justice. When when Paul deals with this in Romans, it's clear there's no one who is just. There's no one righteous. No, not one. And yet the Old Testament can regularly refer to someone. Job was a just man and Noah was a righteous man. And it's, it's in a relative sense. And in the sense of the psalmist and his enemies, he's innocent. They're guilty. He's just. They're unjust. And he's saying, God, you're just. Can you vindicate me? Can you defend me from this unjust attack? He's praying for God's justice. The psalmist do this as well. Oh, Lord, would you come down and smash the wicked? Stop them from doing harm. We can pray according to God's mercy and his grace, and we can pray according to his justice. Oh, Lord, return and fight the nations of the earth with the sword of your mouth. Redeem your people. Deliver them. And so he prays according to both. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord, according to your justice. 
Give me life. Pray according to God's character. Fourth, pray with right perspective. Now we get to the the nub of the problem. What is the immediate threat that has got him so excited, passionate? Well, it's they're drawing near. It's that sense of dread when you see an enemy drawing closer. They draw near. You persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. Notice the contrast, near and far. And when people who are far from God's law, which means there's nothing restraining them, there's no rule, there's no ethic, there's no values holding them back. These are ruthless people. We've seen already they plot, they slander, they conspire. And again, the book of Daniel gives examples of how things like that can happen. They they literally set up Daniel to be killed in a lion's den. The Lord delivered him, but that was a plot of his enemies. They draw near to persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. So his enemies draw near to him. They seek his harm. They seek his harm. Um, The harm may just be to tarnish his reputation, to slander him. The harm may be his death. Um, I I think this covers the gamut. And again and again in Psalm 19, we've, we've been aware of, we've seen these enemies at work. The psalmist is aware of them. And they're far from God's law, which means they're capable of all sorts of wickedness. And when we're in trouble and trials, our problems can seem really big right in front of our face. They can can blot out the sun. Um, But the psalmist here has right perspective. So he begins, they draw near, they're far from your law. But then he repeats to himself and to the Lord the far greater fact. Yes, they draw near to him. Yes, they're far from God's law. But you are near, O Lord. He's not calling on God to draw near. He's recognizing God already is near. And that's the perspective we need to have in our trials. It's not not as bad as you think. They're not as dangerous as you think. They're still just as dangerous and wicked as he thought. The reality that gives him stability, the reality that gives him confidence and comfort, is not that he's overestimated their danger, but he has one with him who's far greater. This is the far greater fact that we can forget in our fear, we can become practical atheists. I'll talk to people who are full of anxiety, and they will rightly name the dangers against them. The problem is not that you've exaggerated the difficulty. Sometimes that's the case. But frequently, no, you're right on. They may fire you. She may leave you. The cancer may be terminal, or whatever the issue is. Frequently, the problem for us is, but, but tell me about God in relationship to this problem. We, we've forgotten who he is. This psalmist has not forgotten. In his danger, in his um, exposure, he is well aware that even as his enemies draw near, God is already near to him. And all your commandments are true. And that is right perspective. Not pretending your problems are less than they are, but rather factoring them in to a universe where there's a covenant-keeping God who loves you and is near to you, how does that affect things? Turn over to Psalm 77. This is one of the ways the uh, psalmist in Psalm 77... um, No, Psalm 73, sorry, Psalm 73, is able to deal with the threat of the wicked. You remember Psalm 73... Um, Truly God is good to Israel, to those of the pure heart. As for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he's got his eyes on the wicked, and man, they're getting away with it. Man, they're they're not having troubles like everybody else. They're not not having difficulties. Bodies are fat, they're, they're praised, people admire them, and they're wicked. What's the point of being godly? And then he says this in verse 16. But when I thought to understand this, how to make sense of the wicked, it seemed to me a worrisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. 
And then he brings God into the picture. Yeah, yeah, they're getting away with it for a little while. They're, they're seeming to prosper now, like a flower and grass that's here for a day and withers. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they're destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast. He's looking back on his previous anxiety, dissatisfaction, recognizing, man, I was I was I was adult. What's what's his consolation? Nevertheless, I am continually with me. You nevertheless, I am continually with you, and you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you'll receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire apart from you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the portion the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And then here's the beautiful reality. For those, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who's unfaithful to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. At the end of the day, what balances the scales and calms him as he sees the wicked flourish and prosper, they're far from God, and God is near to me. And that's good enough for me. That's, that's what I'm holding to. And so as he sees his enemies drawing near with evil purpose, drawing near unrestrained by God's law, he comforts himself and he puts that into right perspective by confessing God is already near. God is already near. God is present to act for his children. As you're blank, God is present to act for his children. But also notice the connection that God is near to those who are near to his word. They're far from God's word. By implication, they're far from God. The psalmist confesses, Lord, you're near to me. And then he adds in all your commandments are true. This is, again, something we see in Scripture. Turn, I won't ask you to turn to many more places. Turn to Isaiah 66. Who is God near? To whom is he near? To whom does he draw near? Isaiah 66 There's a clear answer to this. Some of the Israelites may have been tempted to think that because of the grandeur and the pomp and the size and the scope of Solomon's temple, that had attracted the Lord God to come and reside with them. God is not impressed by Solomon's temple. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hands made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. It's not impressed by the architecture. But this is the one to whom I will look. He was humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The one God pays attention to, the one God draws near to, is the one who takes God's word seriously. How, how you deal with God's word is how you deal with God. Right? Think of the foolishness of continually ignoring, misunderstanding, not paying attention to somebody, your friend, your husband, your wife, when they speak their word to you, and yet insisting you love them and take them seriously. My wife said to me the other day, are you even listening to me? Which I thought was a strange way to start a conversation. Um, (laughs) But the implication being, if I'm not listening to her, or when she listens, I'm listening with half in the air, so I half remember and I misunderstand and I don't get what she said. There's no amount of no, but I really do love her. I don't. Because what she says to me is a part of who she is. It's an extension of who she is. It's her interacting with me. Well, God has spoken to us in his word. We can't fool ourselves into thinking we have deep devotion and love for God or his son and not also having deep devotion for his word he spoke to us that reveals himself and his son to us. They're, they're a matched pair. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. So the wicked are far from God, and they're far from his word. God is near 
to act for his children. He is present to act for his children, and he is near to those who are near to his word. Finally, verse 52, pray with right confidence. So we're to pray fervently, letting it all out. We're to pray unceasingly, rising early in the morning, late at night, with our prayer life informing our scripture reading and our scripture reading informing our prayer life. We are to pray according to God's character, according to who he is. We're to pray with the right perspective. Yes, we're aware of the threats and the problems in our life, but we also need to be aware of God and his presence and his promises. Finally, praying with right promises, with right confidence. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Just two points here, and we'll sing our closing song. One, believe in the Bible's own self-testimony. Believe the Bible's own self-testimony. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. God's word informs us of the character of God's word. Now, that may sound circular, but what other source could we go to? One of the things I'll, I'll challenge people who are playing at Christianity of a more liberal stripe, some of the conversations I've entered into when I've been on um, once or twice, I've had the opportunity to be in dialogues over at Simpson, and, is th- th- these are people who love Jesus, but they're nervous, or many of them. I shouldn't lump them all in one category. Many of them are nervous about taking the Bible too seriously. And what I keep trying to press back on is, this Jesus whom you love, what does he say about the Bible? He says, heaven and earth will pass away before one jot of the law becomes void. Um, if if th- this Bible makes radical claims about itself, which gives you one of two options. Either this is a book of lies we should run from, or it is the word of the living God. What it can't be is, is good and useful wisdom. Books full of good and Useful wisdom don't make radical claims like, truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota of or dot will pass in the law until all is accomplished, Matthew five eighteen. Good teachers don't say, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, Matthew twenty four thirty five, Luke sixteen seventeen. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So if we're going to give any credence to God's word, we're going to need to have an incredibly high view of God's word. There's no possibly valid, consistent way of just taking the Bible as a good resource. Listen to Psalm 19's testimony of Scripture. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The Bible will not allow us half measures. The claims it makes about itself are astoundingly broad, high, and absolute. We can be instructed by that, or we can reject it. What we can't do is play games with it and call it useful. Believe the Bible's own self-testimony. And believe the Lord Jesus' testimony. When he prayed the night before he was betrayed, John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Take, take Jesus' word for it. Believe the Bible's own self-testimony. And then in believing it, point B, rely on the surety of God's word. At the end of the day, I think these are the two comforts the psalmist has. One, even as his enemies draw near to him, God is already drawn near to him. God is already there. And two, they're far from God's word, and he is clinging to it. He's waking up at night to meditate on it. He has the nearness of God, and he has God's certain word. And those two realities are enough for him. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. So, in in summary, when you are in deep affliction, when your enemies are drawing near, pour your heart out. Don't hold back. Let it all out to the Lord. And pray night and day, morning and evening, 
with your prayer life informing your scripture reading and vice versa. Pray according to God's character. Consider who he is and what he has said and pray according to his character and to his promises. Um, Pray keeping the right perspective. Even as you're unable to not be aware of the danger coming, factor in a living, holy, good God who is for you. And pray never doubting, never wavering in your confidence on the certainty of God's word. God is for us, and we have his promises, and we have his word. And he is faithful, and he will prove himself faithful. And ask the worship team to come up, and we'll sing our closing song.